welcome to Central Baptist Church. I'm here with some of our students in the student ministry, from the student ministry, and we're just here to say welcome. We're so glad that you are joining us online, and uh, you are giving up uh, possibly your uh, your Fourth of July morning to hang out with us and be um, in Streamland. That's a, a nod to my good friend Kevin Lawford. Uh, that, uh, yeah, you know, he used to say Streamland. Hey, if you are new with us, if you haven't connected with us before, you can connect by texting uh, new to CBC to 94000. And uh, we'd love to connect with you that way. And if you are, are here right now watching us on 4th of July, we want to know what your favorite firework is. And, uh, and if you have a cool story, uh, we'd love to hear about it. But I'm <laughs> oh, dying over here. Um, I, I'd love to know, what are you, you guys' favorite fireworks? Um, my favorite firework is a Saturn missile. A Saturn missile? Yes, Saturn okay. missile. Okay. I like rum and candles. Those rum and candles. my favorite. Yeah. Cool. I like the little cupcake flares that just like burn everything. I have no idea what that is, but I enjoy it. I like the giant sparklers that are like really big. Okay. Okay. I like the ones that fly up that are cars. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay. Uh, I like the large, like heavy duty poppets. Okay, so what is a heavy duty pop? -up? Okay, so you know like the little individual firecrackers that you light off, like the yes. little ones? It's like those, so if you throw them on the ground and it's the same size explosion except poppets. Okay. So you throw them on the ground and they sound like a gunshot okay. and they're awesome. That's crazy. What about you? I like Rome and, oh, not Rome candles, artillery shells. I love artillery shells. Um, that's pretty cool. So do you guys have any any cool stories of, um, okay, let me, let me hear some stories. Okay. So we light our fireworks in a um, cul-de-sac and several artillery shells fell over. So they're lighting like all the houses oh. up. So that was great. That's horrible. It's like explosions. Uh, my dad got some fireworks from Missouri that are not legal in Oklahoma. Oh, snap. And basically they're the ones you stab into the ground. And so we stabbed it into the ground, lit it off. It did not go all up in the air. It went like four feet in the air, came back to the ground, blew up, and it cut my leg oh, from... Man. Debris. That's crazy. Any other stories? Any? Oh, wow. Okay. Go for it. You guys can have that microphone. My favorite story is when Ian's dad, wherever he is, um, decided to make a flamethrower out of a bunch of, uh, I believe, their sparklers and put them down a metal tube and it did not go as planned. Yeah, he made a flamethrower. It was cool. Goodness. That's it was, neat. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah. Here you go, Brady. <laughs> when I was like nine, I was given a box of smoke bombs just to light off by myself. And I lit one and I panicked and dropped it into the box and there was a giant smoke cloud and I had bad asthma at the time and nearly died. It's a horrible story. When my brother threw like I think the Roman candles that shoot up multiple uh -huh. fireworks, yeah. he did that to my face. Oh goodness. It was really funny though. Oh, Didn't like light your hair on fire or anything? No, that's um, good. So one Not of my friends, cool. he had a bunch of uh, illegal, or they were illegal at one point, the poppets, and he grabbed them and he was throwing them at my feet, and then he, uh, I grabbed one and I threw it at his feet, and it made him bleed all the way down to his leg. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, fireworks, fireworks can get pretty, pretty scary, but we hope that you will be, uh, that you'll be safe with your fireworks uh, tonight as you uh, light fireworks. I think a lot of people did. Fireworks last night. Well, where we are living right now, um, we we had a lot of people uh, have fireworks. Anyway, um, we are so glad that you could join us today. Um, you guys have any other like like patriotic things to, to talk about? Yes. God bless America. Merk. Yeah. You heard it here first. 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 America. All right. Well, love you guys so much. So glad that you could join us. And uh, we're, we're just uh, glad that you're joining us today. See you guys.
So Jesus said to those who had come to believe in him, If you remain in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. But they answered, We are the descendants of Abraham. We have never been slaves to anyone. So how can you say we will become free? You see, they answered Jesus in the same way we might. I mean, we're Americans, right? We live in the land of the free. We sing songs about it. We get together and have parties and fireworks, all to celebrate our nation's freedom. But Jesus was speaking of a different kind of freedom, a freedom that can only be found in him. He answered them, this is the truth. Everyone who chooses a life of sin isn't free. They are a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son or a daughter, they belong forever. So if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Good morning and welcome to Central. Let's stand together and let's worship our great God. I'm so glad you made it to church. Come on, let's sing. the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yes, He does. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise.
You guys can have a seat and take a load off your feet. Uh, my name is Noah McCormick. I'm the student pastor here at Central Baptist, and we're so glad that you could join us. And then for all of you guys online, we're so glad that you are joining us from the comfortable couch that you're sitting on or the coffee shop or um, the bathroom or wherever you're looking at us. But um, so glad that you could join us. Hey, if you are new with us, we'd love to connect with you. You can connect through our app through our website or on the cue card in front of you on the chair back. Um, just scan that and we'd love to connect with you. And also, if you're new with us in the house today, we've got uh, like visitor packets out there. I was saying like we're giving away shirts or something. Just go grab one on the way out if you haven't grabbed one yet. Or if you have, I'm not going to tell anyone. Just go grab one. Um, so uh, so do that. It's going to be great. Hey, um, so, okay. Okay. I have to calm myself down for a minute. <laughs> All right. There is a lot of pressure with it being 4th of July and a Sunday for churches to just throw the name of America in front of God. And I've, I've struggled today with being like, okay, how do I be a welcome guy and the hype guy for this church and also say, Happy 4th of July. And this is how I've chosen to do that. <laughs> God is, is way bigger than America. And today on this day, we get the, the privilege to thank God for living in just the best country. A country that we are free to say whatever we want to say about God. That we're free to come and worship in this church, that we're able to, to have the joy of the Lord. And we do not get reprimanded. We do not get arrested. We do not get silenced at all. That we can actually shout out a praise to God wherever. That is such a privilege. So two things. One, we thank God for this nation because we get to praise him. And then secondly, I think that we take a moment to understand where we are and say, God, do an amazing work in other countries. We, we, we don't want the gospel to be silenced in other countries. We don't want to use this time to take advantage of the fireworks and just a, a you know, just a time of just hanging out and not think about the other people in the world that can't celebrate the way that we can. And the biggest thing, the biggest thing that we can thank God for inside of this country is that we are free to love him openly. So let's do two things. Let's honor God by worshiping today. And then also, Let's take a moment just to pray for the nations that don't get this privilege. Let's pray. God, you are gracious and you are good. And we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to shout out a praise to you, God. God, thank you for this country. Thank you for the 4th of July and how fun it is and how it brings people together and how we get to shoot off our money and all of that. God, thank you. Um, God, but we, we lift up those other countries that right now that would kill to be able to speak in a microphone about you. That would, that would, that would, that will and have died for your name. God, we thank you. God, I pray that you will do an amazing work in those countries to, to bring your word and to make people bold to, to be able to stand up and say that they love you and give governments the, the ability and the power and the, the, the knowledge of you to say, uh, no, you can definitely be free to worship the one true God. God, we love you. We trust you. We will always give you glory. We always give you praise forever and always. Amen. 
Amen. Thank you, Noah. Well, church, I invite you to stand with me and let's sing it out at the top of our lungs this morning, giving God the praise that he is so worthy of. No matter whether we're on the mountaintop or the valley, he is still worthy. And I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemies. I raise a hallelujah louder than the unbelief. I raise a hallelujah.
one who can make beauty from ashes. He makes life from death. He trades a symbol of evil for a symbol of life. I'm so thankful for Christ. Let's continue worshiping this morning. Anxiety, surrendered to the name of Jesus. Just give it to Him. Thank you, Father. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. Your name cannot.
You unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies until all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name, and I've been born again into your family. Your blood flows through. so hard to understand. It's so hard to comprehend that God would give his son so that we might be called his children. Let's just sing that chorus one more time if you know it. I'm no longer a slave to fear as our prayer. And we are putting our confidence in Christ this morning. Because I'm no longer a slave to fear and I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear And I am a child of God And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. It's great to worship with you through song this morning. You can go ahead and have a seat at this time. Amen. Puts a whole new spin on it. We're not just Christians. We're not believers. A child of God. 
And that's the message that we have to get out there. Uh, as you support the ministries and missions of Central Baptist Church through your gifts, that's what you do. My name is Matt Flynn. I'm one of the associate pastors here at Central. And if you came prepared to give today to help support the missions and ministries of Central Baptist Church, to get the message out there, to be a child of God, the gospel message, then there's several ways you can do it. You can put your uh, offering envelope in one of the boxes as you exit out. Or the easiest thing to do is just go to centralgives.com and you'll see a variety of different ways that you can go there and help support these ministries. Just like Vacation Bible School last week and hundreds of kids got to come into this facility to hear the name of Jesus, to hear the gospel message. And then you think about it, they go back out into the community again to their homes, to their families, the grandparents. And that's what we're about, to do that time and time again. And so thank you, thank you so much for supporting. Let's go to the Lord right now and thank him for how he provides and as we move forward and ask his blessing. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we come before you right now during this time, we just ask again, uh, everything belongs to you. We're just stewards. That's all we are. We ask for wisdom and discernment. Take what is given today, use it, multiply it time and time again for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, Matt. This is the worship, the time in our worship service where we dismiss our kiddos to go to preschool worship and children's worship. So if I can have four-year-olds through kindergartners, you will exit and they'll be halfway down the hall on the left. They'll be with Miss Emily today. We have to hide. They have a game where they go in the room and hide from Miss Emily and she has to find them. They're really hard to find too. They giggle a lot and they're very loud. Okay, my first through fourth graders, if you'll be careful and not run over my little friends who are still going down the hall. First through fourth graders will be all the way to the end of the hall and to your right. They will be in big kids worship. Thank you. That's kind of dramatic. <laughs> hey guys, I'm glad to see everybody here today. My name is Clayton. I'm the senior pastor here at Central, and man, it's good to see all of you um, here with us today. You know, I, I've kind of broken a rule in preaching, and man, I was I was down there singing too loud uh, right before I got up here to speak. And you know, you got to be careful because your voice will go um, from you. So I got my, me some water down here uh, just in case I needed that. But man, it was awesome. Man, it was worship was really good today. Uh, man, those were awesome, perfect song choices, Ryland, whoever chose them. Good job. Uh, bonus points for you um, today. Man, it was, it was really, really good. Well, hope you guys are having a great 4th of July weekend. It's, it's been fun um, around my house. Uh, last night, man, we were getting ready for, for church, and we were just kind of hanging out. Our family was in the, in the, the living room, and we were just uh, watching TV, and I was ironing my clothes, getting ready for today. And, and then all of a sudden... It was like a war went off in my uh, outside, you know, and my, our dogs are flipping out. I don't know if y'all have dogs that are like ours, but um, our big lab, he just wants to sit in your lap, and he just won't leave you alone. And our, our other dog, uh, she just starts shaking uncontrollably for hours. I mean, she just running around hiding everywhere uh, because of all of the, the fireworks going off. And so it happened last night, and I'm going, it is not the 4th of July, but hey, we'll take it. And so um, we went outside in our backyard, and for about 30 minutes, someone, uh, a neighbor behind us, uh, we have a, a road that's where our, our backyard is, and so on the, across on the other side of the road, man, they, they spent a fortune you know, uh, on fireworks, and it was awesome. We just hung out, and some of us, uh, some of our family went and sat on, on the trampoline, and we were, just, we were just watching the fireworks. Man, it was, it was great, and I, and I realized something. You know what the, the best kind of fireworks are? 
Someone else's fireworks. Those are the best kind of fireworks, okay? Because, I mean, they spent thousands of dollars, and I'm just going, you're, you're all are awesome. Way to go, you know? And I just got to watch fireworks um, for free. It was not a disappointment um, at all last night. But sometimes life is full of disappointments, like this. If you pull your hamstring in the first pitch of the softball season, y'all know what I'm talking about. That is a disappointment. After the rainstorm, if, if you realize that you left your sunroof open in your car, that's, that's a disappointment, isn't it? If you jump into a pool and realize your phone's in your pocket, <laughs> you know, that, that's a big disappointment. If you rip your khakis playing ping pong with teenagers right before the worship service and you gotta get up on stage, that is a disappointment. I'm not saying it happened today, but, you know, that, that, that's a disappointment. If you burn the Thanksgiving turkey, that's a pretty big disappointment. If you're flying home from South Africa and the guy next to you is having a heart attack and you have to have, uh, do an emergency landing in Zambia and then it takes 57 hours to get home and you miss your connecting flights in Rome and London. That's two days to get home. That is a disappointment. I'm not saying that all these things have happened to me, but three of those things have happened to me. I'll let you figure out what those are. But sometimes in life, we hope things happen and they don't turn out the way that we wanted them to turn out. And life sometimes can be a disappointment, really. But have you ever asked yourself this? Have you ever been a disappointment? Sometimes in my life, I've been a disappointment. Perfect example. A couple weeks ago, my daughter says, hey, Dad, can we go to Goodwill? So me and, uh, and Hannah and one of her friends, we went to Goodwill, and they were, like, looking for some, you know, some trendy old shirts. And, and so I went over to the, the men's section, and I started looking through all these shirts, and I'm like, you know what? These are not bad. Like, they look pretty good. So I start pulling them out. Pulled out one, two, three. I pulled about eight shirts out. And then I, I've, I know enough to realize that I need a second opinion, you know? So I went and took these shirts, I put them in a different area, and then I said, Hannah, come over here. She's just going, yeah, this happened. And so I said, Hannah, come over here. And so I started looking at pull, holding these up and saying, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? What do you think about this? And she's just like, mm-mm. And then she says these two words. She says, Dad, no. Okay? <laughs> Those are just two words. That was it. Okay? And I realized that as I'm getting old, Sometimes I am just kind of a disappointment in my choices with my kids that my, what's it, my fit, is that right? Is that the right word? My fit is not, um, not as what it should be anymore, my, my outfit, okay? So I need some help, and I realize that sometimes I am a disappointment, even in the eyes of my kids, and I'm totally cool with that. You know, I'm getting old, I'm fine with it. When I'm older, I won't even care anymore. So, but, but today, we're going to look at a disciple who out of all the disciples was probably the biggest disappointment um, in his life. And I want to read the list of disciples, and maybe you can figure out who this guy is. Matthew chapter 10, starting in verse 2, here's what it says. It says, the names of the 12 apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. So in our series of going through the disciples this summer, we have finished the first group of four, Peter, Andrew, James, and John, the two sets of brothers, the, probably the most profound and important disciples that, that we have um, in the scriptures. We're in the second group. In fact, we're on disciple number seven today. So we're halfway through this second group. We've looked at Philip. We looked at Nathaniel, who is also called Bartholomew. And today we're going to get into the disciple who was the biggest dis disappointment, um, I think, in his life than any of the other disciples. And it is not Judas. It was Matthew. Matthew was probably one of the most disappointing figures that we have in scripture, or he began that way. So let me give you a little background about Matthew, the guy we're gonna talk about today. So this guy, he ended up writing one of the gospels, the gospel of Matthew, um, which is pretty awesome. He has one uh, named after himself. Uh, that'd, that'd be really cool. You know, just say, you know what? One of the disciples is named after me. That's, that's just a cool thing. But he was actually uh, also called Levi in, in Mark and Luke. So he had kind of a different name. And the reason he was called Levi, we think, is that 
because he was of the lineage of the tribe of Levi. And the tribe of Levi was one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So Jacob's sons, Old Testament, Levi was one of the, one of the, one of the, 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 the brothers, the 12 brothers. And this, this group of this tribe was different than all the other tribes because they were given special treatment. And they were called out to do something different. All the other tribes were given land. And so sometimes in the back of your Bible, you may have like one of those maps that show all the different twi- tri- tribes of Israel. And they had all these different land, but, but the tribe of Levi didn't have any land. They weren't given any land. They just were able to live in different cities. The reason is, is because they had a specific job to be the Levites, the priests, the holy ones of the people of Israel. And we believe that Matthew was of the lineage of Levi. And so from a young age, he probably learned the scriptures. He was probably proficient in a lot of things. He was a smart guy. And his, his mom, I guess, maybe one day said, hey, Levi, what do you want to be when you grow up? Matthew, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you can expect him to say things like, you know what, I want to be like my, my brothers, my older brothers. I want to be like them. Or I want to be like my, my dad or my grandfather, my great-grandfather. I want to be like uh, the rest of my family. But Matthew may, possibly didn't say that because he probably took a step back and said, you know what, I want to be different. I don't want my life to be like that. I want to be rich. Amen? I want to have it all. I want a different kind of life. And sometime in his life, Matthew made this this turn where he turned away from his family heritage. He turned away from serving the Lord as a a priest, kind of like a a New Testament, like like a pastor, pastoral type, Old Testament kind of pastor kind of person. He turned away from that and said, you know what? I want to live my own life. I want to do my own own thing. I want to be different. And so we know Matthew not as a Levitical priest. We know him as what? Tax collector. We know him as something different. You see, tax collectors were Jews who worked for the Romans, who were occupying the land during that time. And we know that Matthew was probably pretty smart. He was probably educated. If he had this job, he probably could read Hebrew and and Greek and Aramaic and probably some Latin. He knew figures and math really well. He knew business. In fact, he had to know enough of those things and be um, successful enough that he was able to actually purchase the right to be a tax collector. Because back then, you just didn't sign up to be a tax collector. You had to pay to be a tax collector in a certain place. And so he said, you know what? I want to be in Capernaum because that's where all the businesses are in that region. So that's kind of a hub, a business hub. I want to be the tax collector there because I can get really rich um, just fleecing everybody uh, with taxes in that area. And so he had to actually buy like a tax franchise from the Romans to be able to, to be a tax collector. So he was wealthy enough, he was prosperous enough, he was successful enough to be able to do that. And he goes and buys this tax franchise. And with Roman soldiers all around him, with muscle around him all the time, he was able to extract taxes from his fellow Jewish citizens. And it wasn't just simple taxes. Here are some taxes they had. They had the production tax, which was one-tenth of of your crops or one-tenth of your goods. You also had the income tax, which was 1% of your wages. You also had a poll tax, which just meant that every year you had to pay just to be alive, okay? You had had a tax for just being alive. You also had a purchase tax, which is like a sales tax for today. And they even had a road use tax, which is like an ancient toll road tax. We know all about that here in Oklahoma, don't we? They had those. And on top of all of that, they had extortion money and bribes that Matthew was allowed to extract from people so that he could get rich. So in this Jewish society, tax collectors are outcasts. They were hated by the people. They were religious outcasts and social outcasts. And it was so bad that the the Jewish Talmud, which is just a, a collection of the books of Jewish law, that it actually says that it is okay to lie and to cheat a tax collector. They're so bad, you know what? It's okay. It's okay to do that. We all understand that we need to be about that. And Matthew's living in the middle of that, but he probably lived in a big house up on top of the hill, 
there was a hill in Capernaum, I don't know. He probably had, had a big house. He probably had a big a fence around it. And he probably had, had private security. And every day he would come down all out of his big house and he would come down and sit in his tax booth with Roman soldiers, soldiers all around him and he would tax the people. He was supposed to be a priest. But he was a big disappointment to his family and to his community and he became a tax collector. But here's what happens in Matthew chapter 9. Matthew 9, Jesus passed on from there. And he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And Matthew rose and followed Jesus. You probably heard that story, you know, growing up. You probably heard that a lot lot of time where Jesus goes up to Matthew and says, follow me. And Matthew gets up and goes. You're like, wow, that's that's an awesome story. But did you ever think about who else was there in that story? It wasn't just Jesus and the tax collector. You had all these people around. You probably had Roman soldiers around. And Jesus is already, has a crew. He already has some disciples with him. And so the disciples that are following after Matthew, they go in, or after Jesus, they're standing next to Jesus are probably four fishermen at least, Peter and Andrew, James and John, guys that lived in Capernaum, guys that had to go to this tax collector named Matthew and pay the taxes and bribe Matthew and give him a little bit extra. These guys that had to go and and every time that they, they took fish from the sea and went along the road and, and took them to, to, into town, they had to pay a tax. Every time they caught something, they had to pay a tax. Every year for just being alive, they had to pay a tax. And they'd pay extra and extra on top of that. They hated this guy. They hated him. They hated him so much because it changed, he changed their lives. We know that the disciples were having to fish at night. And you're like, why? What's the big deal about that? Well, it was illegal to fish at night. You weren't allowed to do that. And the reason they were doing that is because they weren't making ends meet. They were, they were barely getting by. They were starving and, and especially Peter, Peter who had a family, his family is probably starving and struggling to get by, and they hated this guy. And Jesus walks up and stops, and they're probably thinking, you know what, Jesus is about to give it to this Matthew guy, you know what I'm talking about? And he turns and looks and says, follow me, and you can, you can imagine what these disciples thought. Like, whoa, 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 Jesus, we just took a poll, and <laughs> not this guy, okay? In any, anybody else, you cannot choose this guy. You, you don't understand who he is. You don't understand how people hate him so much. There's no way he can be one of the disciples. And Jesus looks at him and says, follow me. Follow me. And I believe Jesus was trying to teach his disciples something. I believe he's trying to teach us something as well, that, that his mission is not to the perfect Jesus' mission is not to those who are put together. No, in fact, Jesus' mission is to the messed up. And what a great story that is. What a great statement that is, that Jesus' message is not to those who have it all together, but to those who are completely and utterly messed up. He knew Matthew's occupation. He knew Matthew's reputation, and he didn't care. He didn't care. In fact, that wasn't his focus. His focus wasn't on what it would cause, the the rift it would cause with the disciples. That wasn't his focus. His focus was on what Matthew could become. That's what Jesus' focus was on. With his mission to, to, to the messed up Matthew, his focus was on what Matthew could become when Jesus restored him. It's the same thing for us. Jesus' mission for us in our lives as he as he as he calls us and saves us is that we would be different. That our lives would be different. Our lives would go from one thing to another thing because he restores us. And you know, I bet Matthew struggled. I bet he really struggled as a disciple. Thinking about his past. Thinking about how he had screwed up, how he had been been an utter failure to his family and his community. But then at some time, I think Matthew heard these words that are found in John chapter 10, verse 10. When Jesus is talking about being a shepherd, he says, I am the, the good shepherd. And then he goes on and says this, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. 
And I wonder what Matthew thought about those words. What Jesus was saying is saying, I've not come to punish you. Okay? I've not come to punish you for what you've done. Instead, I have come to give your life a purpose. I'm not here to punish you. I know your problems. I know your past. Matthew, I know your past. But I've not come to punish you. I have come to give your life a purpose. And I bet that was a huge weight off his back. Matthew, the disciple that the other disciples wanted to push away, said, you, 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 gotta, you better walk behind us. You know what? We know, we know your past. We know how you tried to ruin our family. We know how you, you turned away from our God. We know how you've been in bed with the, the Romans. We know all those things. You get behind us. You're different than us. They were shunning him. And he had this weight on him. And Jesus says, you know what? I've not come to punish you. I've come to give your life a purpose. Because see, Matthew, he knew the scriptures. He was, a, he was supposed to be a Levite. He was training to be a Levite. And so he knew the Old Testament. Maybe possibly one of his, one of his passages, one of the passages of the Old Testament that he, he really looked at and said and, and longed for was Psalm 51. Psalm 51 that says this, Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. I wonder if Matthew walked around and just was like, went with his previous life and just like, man, I know I screwed up. I know I messed up. I know my life should have gone this way and I made a bad choice. At some point I made a bad choice and I am living with that, you know, and I feel stuck. And he prayed that prayer, that Psalm 51 prayer, and said, God, please forgive me. Over and over and over again, year after year, knowing that he, he is stuck in his sin and he is stuck in his profession. And the rest of society has said, you know what? You can never be right with us. For the rest of your life, you screwed up. I wonder about for us. How many of you, your sin just weighs so heavy on you? Maybe you're a Christian and you know you've been forgiven, but your past like just drags you down. And you say, what? you know what, I, I can never do what God has called me to do because of my past. My past is just, it's just too much. I feel that weight and I feel that guilt all the time. And maybe for some of you in this room, you are not a believer in Christ and you're hearing this message, it's kind of confusing to you and you're trying to figure out you know, what, what's going on and you would say, you know what, my, my past is just too much. You don't know what I have done. And so you spend your life trying to get right with God. You spend your life trying to make your good things outweigh your bad things. And you know them, and you know that that, that is separating you from a holy God. You know that your life and your past is just messed up, and you try and you try and you try. That was Matthew's life, and he had no hope. And all of a sudden, Jesus says, follow me. And things changed. Life changed. You know what Matthew had to do? Real simple. You know what he didn't have to do? Jesus didn't come to him and say, hey, I'd like for you to stop what you're doing. I'd like for you to go and, and take care of your business. I'd like for you to uh, give back to everybody that, you, that you, you stole from. I'd like for you to, to actually go back into the priesthood and, and, and get your life right with, with your society and, and with God. And then once your, your life is all figured out, then come to me and you can be one of my disciples. He didn't say that at all. He said, I don't care about your past. He said, follow me. Follow me. And all Matthew had to do is what he did. He got up and he went with Jesus. Now that is a message for us today. That all you have to do to be right with the holy God is to follow Jesus. Following Jesus means you repent of your sins and you say, you know what? I need a savior. I can't do this anymore on my own. And I trust that Jesus died on the cross to save me from my sins. That's all you gotta do. How amazing is that? Thank goodness we don't have to spend our entire lives trying to make our good outweigh our bad because I'm telling you what, even your preacher, your pastor up here, I would be in big, big trouble, okay? We would all be in big trouble. But Jesus says, you know what? I don't care about your past. I have come for the messed up. Just follow me. And here, look what happens. Look what happens in Matthew's life. 
something happens, this complete restoration happens and occurs in his life, and it is immediate and it's visible. Luke chapter 5, this is, the story is, is explained in a couple different, um, and recorded a couple different gospels. In Luke chapter 5, verse 29, here's what, here's what happens. It says, and Levi, or Matthew, immediately, right after this happened, after, he's, after he follows Jesus, Levi made him a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of <coughs> tax collectors and others who were reclining at table with him. And the Pharisees and their scribes, they grumbled. They grumbled at his disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answer, answered them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I've not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And in this incredible moment, in this story, there is another important truth that God has for us. And it's this, if you're writing notes, this is number two, Jesus saves the blank to reach the blank. And yes, they're left blank. Okay. Sorry for those of you who are like, I got to fill that in. Okay. You could write blank there, I guess, if you wanted to. Okay. The reason they're left blank is because there's no right answer. It depends on who you are. That God has saved you so that you can reach people that are just like you. God saves sinners so he can save other sinners. And that's an incredible story right there of, of what Matthew did. And so the question that we have for us is this, who am I and who is like me? Because God saved you for a purpose or he wants to save you for a purpose. And it's not just about you, it's about others as well. So you may be a teacher. You may be a business leader. You may be a stay-at-home mom. You may be a retired person. You may be a student, an athlete, a band member. You might be a gamer. It doesn't matter. God has made you specifically for a reason. And he has put you where you are for a specific purpose. And you look at Matthew's life. And the way Matthew was. And what he did immediately following Jesus saving him. And you see that, man, that, is, that needs to be our story as well. You see, Jesus, he saves the blank to reach the blank. What he's saying is, well, the Bible's saying here is that you're saved for a purpose. Every single one of us were saved for a purpose. And, and, and in the middle of that purpose, there's a right way to reach people, and there's a wrong way to reach people. And here's one of the things we need to be doing. We need to be just like Matthew, we don't see him saying this, but we kind of infer but based on who he invited. And it is this, that we need to be telling people that we're messed up too. We got to be telling people that are messed up. Because there's something I know. That you're messed up. I'm messed up. She's messed up. She's definitely messed up. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're all messed up. And, and, and people who are outside of the church, they need to know that. Because people from the outside looking in, they see a closed group, a closed club, and the only way you get into that club is if you live a right life, if you live a good life, if you live a perfect life. And they look at all their lives and they say, you know what, I can never be a part of that. I can never be a part of that. I can never be good enough. And so they walk in these doors and they look a little different than us. And they think, man, if I don't have my tie on, if I don't have my pressed slacks and, and shirt on, then, then people are going to look at me. They're going to think I'm different. They're going to think I'm, I'm not good enough to be in this place. And they need to realize that we're just like them. In fact, some of us are worse than they are. <laughs> and the only difference that we have in our lives is that we've been washed clean. That is the only difference. The only difference is that we've been washed clean and we believe this passage, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 that therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. We believe that. And that is, honestly, that is the only difference that we have between someone who is saved and someone who is not saved, is that not, we're not perfect. We're messed up just like everybody else, but we've been washed clean. But, but here's the deal. Even being saved, you've got baggage, don't you? Like, that sounds all good, but you've got... Baggage, man. Some of you guys look like you're going on like a, 
like a two-month international trip kind of baggage. I mean, you've got a lot of baggage. You're paying extra fees big time for all the baggage that you have. We've all got baggage. And the question is, how in the world, as believers in Christ, as Christians, as disciples, as followers of Jesus, how do we do this whole thing called the Christian life with all the baggage that we have? How, do we, how, do we, how can we be effective? Well, look what, look what Matthew did. But go back to that passage. Matthew hosts a, a party, doesn't he? And he hosts a party and he invites people to meet Jesus. People that are just like him. It says, Levi made a great feast in his house and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at table. I think that's a really funny word, the, the word others. Because <laughs> say, hey, here are all the tax collectors. Matthew knew these guys, but you know what? Who are the others? The Bible's pretty much saying those guys are so bad we don't even want to describe them, okay? They're probably, they're probably uh, thieves. They're probably prostitutes. They're probably the worst of society. And Matthew... As soon as he is saved, he doesn't know a whole lot of theology. He doesn't know, you know, everything, all the ins and outs of, of falling after Jesus. He doesn't have all of that. But you know what? He says, I just, need, I just need to invite my friends. I just need to invite my friends. He says, you know, who does he, who does he know? He doesn't know all these Roman soldiers and all these Pharisees. He doesn't know all these good religious people. He knows other tax collectors and other sinners, the people that he actually could hang out with. Because he, he wasn't allowed to hang out with a lot of other people. So he invites them to his house. And here's something that's crazy. The Bible says that Jesus reclined at the table with them. So reclining at the table, they didn't have chairs back then. They kind of leaned um, on the ground a little bit, had their elbow propped up, and that's how they ate. And Jesus was reclining at the table. So you know what that means? It's crazy. Maybe some of y'all is going to sit well with y'all. Jesus was having a great time with sinners. Okay? He was having an awesome time. He was hanging out with them. It was so crazy and so radical that the Pharisees, they poked their head through the window and they called Jesus' disciples and says, what in the world are y'all doing? Why is he doing that? And Jesus gets up and says, I have not come for you. I've not come for the religious. I've not come for the ones that think they're perfect. They're, they're, they, they, they don't need a savior, do they? They're not in a position where they think they need a savior. I have come for the broken and the hurting a physician comes for those who are sick, and that's who I have come for. You see, Matthew, he's a, he's a perfect disciple because Jesus wants to save and wanted to save people that are just like Matthew. So he didn't have this group of all these perfect people. And you need to understand that all these disciples, they're, let's, that's why we call them the dirty dozen, okay? Because they were dirty. They were messed up. They were sinners just like you and me. They did not have it all together, but that's exactly who God wanted to. To call. And so here's the question. What can we learn from Matthew? What can we learn from this guy? This guy that went from being a, a Levite or possibly a Levite. He was training to be that. He was, it was part of his family heritage. He went from being a Levite to being a tax collector. Can you believe that? But then he went from being a tax collector to a disciple of Jesus. What can we learn from this guy? I think there's a couple things. If you're taking notes, you can write these down. Number one, your gifting is for his glory. The way that God has made you and shaped you, the talents that you have, they're for his glory. I want you to think about this. This is kind of the rest of the story for Matthew. Matthew goes on to write the gospel of Matthew. How did we get that? Well, you know that one of Matthew's talents that he had to have was to be an incredible record keeper. The Romans, they wanted meticulous notes. They wanted perfect records. Matthew had to keep all of those. And so he was probably really just a perfectionist. He wanted everything written down correctly because he, he knew he had to turn that in. He was a smart guy. And so he, he went from taking all of these notes about taxes. Jesus saves him, says, come and follow me. And all of a sudden, Matthew goes and follows Jesus. And Jesus is healing somebody. And what is Matthew doing? He's writing that down. He's like, man, we can remember this, Okay. And then Jesus, one day, he goes up on the side of this hill and he begins to give this sermon. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. You know that's found in the Bible? Matthew chapter five. You know where else it's found in the Bible? Nowhere, okay? That's it. Only place we know about the greatest sermon that Jesus preached was through the, the pen of Matthew. 
Matthew, the perfect record keeper. Do you see that? God knew what he was doing. God called Matthew for a specific purpose. And his gifting was used for God's glory. And so the same thing for you. How has God gifted you? I can't answer that for you, but God has gifted you in a specific way to be used for his glory. I'll leave it at that because you know what that is. Maybe you've been using it for your own glory. You need to turn that around and say, God, how can I use my gifts for your glory? Second thing is this. What we can learn from Matthew is this, that my field of view is my mission field. You know, sometimes I think we, we look at missionaries as being like professional Christians. And that you have to be like overseas, you gotta go to the Philippines, you gotta, you gotta go over to, to South Africa. If you really want to be a missionary, and the reality is, is that we're all called to be missionaries. And our mission field sometimes might be that, but for 99.9% .9 of us, you know what our mission field is? What we can see. What we can see. So when we go to the grocery store, that's your mission field. And when you go to that exact same gas station all the time and you go in, to get that Coke or whatever, get that pack of gum, and you always see those same tellers or those same people working there, that's your mission field. You know what I'm saying? When you're a student, and you're always with that group of kids at school, that's your mission field. When you're a teacher, and you're rubbing shoulders with all the admin, all the admin and all the teachers um, and, and, and faculty at, at school, that is your mission field. We all know that, and we, we, we know that internally, but we actually, we never live it out really. We never live it out fully. Your neighborhood is your mission field. Instead, what we do is we say, you know what? I'm not a professional Christian. I don't have all the answers. I'm not called to, to go overseas. My name is not in the newspaper about going and doing something awesome. I'm not, not up on stage as the pastor. I can't be a real influential Christian. And Jesus is saying, you know what? You can be just like Matthew if you want to. Matthew didn't have it all together. In fact, he was an outcast of society. But you know what? Jesus wanted to reach the outcasts. He wanted to reach those people. So he calls Matthew, and Matthew says, let's throw a party. I just want to tell people about Jesus. I want to introduce them to Jesus. And so you guys, I'm telling you what, you have a great opportunity, opportunity to do that today. I don't know what you're doing for the 4th of July. Maybe you're going over to some people's house. You call them and say, hey, can I invite another family? Maybe you're doing something in your neighborhood, and you need to just go knock on some doors this afternoon and say, hey, Come hang out with us. We're going to have some burgers. It's going to be awesome. We're going to pop other people's fireworks. You know what I'm saying? It's going to be great, okay? Whatever it may be, you have an opportunity to be a Matthew in your community. That's what we need to be. What a, what a great story. Matthew, a guy that it's a big disappointment and turned out to be an incredible, incredible disciple for Jesus. Let's be like him. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the story of Matthew. We, we're, uh, we're just like him sometimes. We all have baggage. We all have a past. Some of us feel like, man, we can never get right with you enough to be used by you. In fact, some of us even believe we, we can never get right with you enough to be saved by you or accepted by you. And we see in Matthew's story that Matthew didn't do anything except for follow Jesus. And the message is clear. Jesus says, you don't have to be perfect. Just follow me. Just repent. Instead of going that way, let's go this other way. Trust in me. And God, I pray for anyone in this room or online watching who needs to do that today. Who needs for the very first time to say, I'm tired of trying to do this on my own. I just, I just want to be clean. I want to be fixed. I want to have a purpose. And God, we know that you can do that. You can restore and you can heal. All we got to do is trust you. So God, I pray if there's anyone in this room, Lord, that, that you would convict them now. Holy Spirit, you would just invade their heart and not let them leave this place without getting right with you, without finding me or finding one of our pastors over in our connection room and, and getting right with you today. God, we, we shouldn't wait. And God, we should always be saying, why not? Why not now? Why should I wait? And you're saying, I'm calling you. There is no wait. Let's go. You want them to live a different life. You want them to have a purpose. So God, we thank you for, for those you're calling right now. 
And God, for those of us who are called, who have, who have chosen you, Lord, sometimes we're walking around with this baggage and we think we can't be used by you. Lord, I pray that you would just uh, forgive us for that sin. The saying we can't be used. If our past is too big. Man, because all we got to do is look at Matthew who went from a nobody outcast, the biggest sinner, to being a disciple who wrote his own gospel. What an incredible, incredibly transformed and changed life. God, we, we need that example in our lives. We need to see that you forgive us. We need to see that you can still use us. So Lord, I pray that we would have missionary eyes, that we would invite people who are just like us, people that... Um, or at the grocery store all the time, people that are in our neighborhoods, people at the restaurant we go to every week. Lord, do we invite them to know Jesus? We would be bold in sharing our faith. God, that we would change this community for your glory, and your glory alone. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. As we close this service, I just wanna thank you for being here. Why don't y'all stand um, with, with me? And let's, let's, let's conclude our worship service by, by just by saying this. If God's calling you to do something, man, don't wait. How tragic would it have been if Matthew said, eh, not right now. He didn't wait. When Jesus called him, he went. And I want to invite you, if you don't know Christ and God's convicting your heart, don't wait. You don't have to have it all together. Just, just do it. I'd love to speak with you after, afterwards. Our staff is over here in the connection room. We'd love to, to talk with you. You know, maybe... You're kind of been on the fence about joining Central. You don't have a church home. Man, same question. Why wait? Why wait? God has a specific plan and a purpose for this church, and maybe you're a part of that, man. We would love to, to talk with you as well about coming and being a part of Central. It's a great church. God's doing some incredible things. Even through this pandemic, things are changing and happening, and I'm excited about uh, being a part of, of Central and what God is doing here. So, so whatever God's calling you to do, let's, let's be obedient to him. And if he's calling you to do something specific today, Fourth of July celebration, to reach out to people in your community, man, don't wait. Go and do that, and let's be Matthews to our community. So let's, let's end by saying our purpose statement together, something we always do to remind us of why we, why we exist and what we're called to do. So it's on the screen behind me so you can read it um, together. So let's do that right now. Here at Central Baptist Church, we exist to live for Christ, to love people, and to make disciples. Thank you guys for being here. Y'all are dismissed.